Really visual. And third pass. And now, lean back and enjoy our live presentation of Centered in the Universe. Good evening. My name is Michael Faulkner. Welcome to the Samuel Ocean Planetarium at Griffith Observatory. We tell stories about the sky here. You've been at it for nearly 90 years, but the tradition goes back as thousands of years to a time when people huddled around a fire, trying to make sense of what they saw in the night sky. They told stories that attempted to answer fundamental questions. Who are we? How do we get here? Why is the world the way it is? Even something as basic as the sunset was filled with drama. The ancient Greeks said Helios, the sun god, drove his chariot over the horizon and darkness fell because Nyx, the goddess of night, drew a curtain between earth and sky. The Chumash of Southern California thought the sun was a torch carried from east to west by a god. And when he passed beyond the western horizon, they got dark. Today, we know the sun is a star. It rises and sets because Earth is a spinning globe, and as Earth turns, the sun seems to move across the sky. That's our story of day and night. Now, our way of answering questions about nature has changed over the last few centuries, but our motivation hasn't. We want to feel at home in the universe. Understanding the world around us and the sky above helps us survive. Recent discoveries challenge some of the stories we tell about the universe. We don't have all the answers, but every day at sunset, when the turning earth carries us beyond the sun's reach, we get another chance to figure things out. The sky darkens, the stars appear. And once again, we confront the ancient mystery of the night sky. Imagine what our ancestors saw when they looked at this. We appear to be at the center of a flat world bounded by the circle of the horizon. A black canopy arcs overhead, dotted with twinkling sparks of light. Like visitors to any strange place, we search for landmarks to orient ourselves. Behind you, notice this group of seven fairly bright stars. Americans call it the Big Dipper. These stars mark the bowl. Here's the handle. The Big Dipper is useful because it helps us find north. If we draw a line from the stars in the front of the bowl, we come to this star, Polaris, the North Star, which is special because it's the only star that doesn't move. Oh. 
If you watch the sky for a few hours, you'll notice that it seems to be turning. Stars rise in the east and set in the west, just like the sun. As the sky turns, the stars pivot around the unmoving Polaris. This celestial North Pole gives us a way to orient ourselves. Long before Americans saw a dipper, some ancient sky watchers saw these seven stars as part of a bear. We call it Ursa Major, Latin for Great Bear. It takes imagination to make a bear out of these stars. But even if Ursa Major doesn't really look like a bear, it behaves like one. In winter, when bears hibernate, Ursa Major seems to burrow down at the horizon. In springtime, when hungry bears wake up, Ursa Major gets up to prowl, rising high and away from the horizon. This predictability suggested that the stars could be used to, to guide us. As we searched for other patterns, we projected our dreams and nightmares on the canopy of heaven. We filled the sky with stories. Kings and queens, monsters and heroes parade through the night. These star pictures called constellations transformed the sky into a book of legends and folklore that anyone from shepherd to shaman could read. The stars don't dwell alone. Two brighter lights dominate the heavens. What is the moon? It tracks across the sky, but unlike the stars, it appears each night or day in a different part of the sky. It also changes its shape as if it had a mind of its own. Sailors and fishermen notice that tides follow the moon. People from every culture counted full moons to measure time. The English word month comes from moon. The brightest light in the sky is the sun. And the ancient people worshipped it. Their lives depended on it. Its changing path across the sky defines the seasons. When to plant, when to harvest, and when to hunt migrating animals. Since the sun and moon move with apparent purpose and clearly influence events on Earth, people wondered, are there other moving celestial lights that affect us as well? Sky watchers noticed that some of the brighter stars move out of sync with the other stars. They called these five wandering lights planets. The Greeks explained the motion of the stars by imagining they were lights fixed to a gigantic sphere that turned about Earth. But they were baffled by the planets, which moved at varying speeds and sometimes even abruptly changed course as if they were deliberately moved by gods. The Skywatchers observed that these wandering planets travel through a very narrow band of the sky called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic passes through a series of constellations known as the zodiac. Around 2000 BC, astronomers in ancient Mesopotamia divided the zodiac into 12 constellations or signs. We've all heard of Leo, heard of Libra, Scorpio, and the rest. Ancient astronomers thought of the zodiac as a stage on which the sun, moon, and planets performed, acting out a story that we could perhaps understand. Ancient kings and generals, grasping for hints of their future, paid soothsayers to predict and interpret the motions of the planets. These astrologers helped lay the foundation of our oldest science astronomy. They tried to make sense of the strange dance of the planets. They measured positions, kept careful records, and stretched their imaginations to explain what they saw. The first theory that seemed to work dates back to the second century.
Alexandria in Egypt was a center of education in the ancient world. Scholars from all over the Roman Empire came here to study. Astronomers in ancient Alexandria didn't have telescopes. They used an armillary sphere, a device constructed of metal rings to track the stars and planets. Claudius Ptolemy was the greatest geographer of his day. Columbus would one day use Ptolemy's maps to plan his voyage across the Atlantic. But Ptolemy also wanted to chart the heavens. Using geometry, he devised a system which seemed to account for the wanderings of seven celestial lights. The sun and moon Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Like other astronomers before him, Ptolemy assumed that Earth is the center of the universe, motionless, and that the planets were attached to rotating transparent spheres. To account for the more subtle motion, Ptolemy believed each planet also moved on its own small circle, or epicycle. Spheres and circles were considered divine forms by the ancient Greeks. Any description of the universe required the divine planets to move along perfectly circular paths. Ptolemy's system of crystal spheres whirling within a shell of stars worked well enough to predict the motions of the planets. For 1,500 years, Ptolemy's view of the universe stood largely unchallenged. In the 17th century, a courageous thinker drew a very different picture of the cosmos. He was Galileo Galilei of Italy the first modern scientist. Galileo's revolutionary discoveries were made with a device designed to bring distant objects closer to view. In the winter of 1609, he mounted two lenses in a paper tube. It only had the magnifying power of a good pair of modern binoculars. Galileo pointed his simple telescope at the night sky. He saw things no one had ever imagined. Things that challenged many long-held beliefs about our place in the universe. When he looked at Jupiter, Galileo discovered it is circled by four moons. They had never been seen before. So Earth is not the only center of motion in the universe. When he observed our own moon, he saw it is not a perfect sphere. It actually has mountains and valleys. So Earth is not the only physical world. When he observed Venus, Galileo discovered the planet goes through phases just like the moon, from crescent to nearly full and back again. These phases are impossible in Ptolemy's Earth-centered universe. Galileo's observations convinced him 15 centuries of established thought must be wrong. A Polish astronomer, Nicholas Copernicus, had already proposed that the Sun, not Earth, was the center of the universe. Now Galileo had the evidence that proved it. Placing the Sun at the center accounts for the phases of Venus explains the motions of the planets, and proves Earth, too, is a planet orbiting the sun. Galileo also discovered the Milky Way is made up of countless dim stars. To be so dim, they must be farther than stars visible to the naked eye. Perhaps space is not bound by a crystal sphere, but filled with stars. If this were true, Ptolemy's crystal sphere would be shattered and the universe would be truly immense.
1781, William Herschel in England discovered the planet Uranus, doubling the size of the known solar system. Later discoveries would increase it further, but Herschel was after even bigger game. He wanted to map the universe. After 30 years of painstaking observation, he concluded that the universe is shaped like a wheel with our sun at the center. He called the system of stars the galaxy. At the beginning of the 20th century, the American astronomer Harlow Shapley discovered that the galaxy is even bigger. It contains billions of stars, and our sun is nowhere near the center, but in the suburbs of this celestial city. Most astronomers believe the Milky Way galaxy to be the whole universe, all of it. Then in the 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble challenged that idea. telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory overlooking Los Angeles was the largest of its time. Hubble used this giant telescope to observe mysterious objects known as spiral nebulae. He trained it on the best known of these the Great Nebula in Andromeda. Looking through an eyepiece, earlier astronomers had sketched the nebula, but they could see little more than a foggy patch of light with a hint of structure. Hubble applied photography and transformed his telescope into a giant camera. His photographic plate soaked up light gathered by the telescope over the course of several hours. What they revealed was amazing. Millions of stars too faint for the eye to see. Hubble calculated Andromeda's distance. It isn't in our galaxy at all, but lies far beyond the Milky Way. The universe must be huge. Hubble's photographs proved Andromeda is another galaxy, just like the Milky Way. And the universe is filled with galaxies. Once thought to contain all of creation, the Milky Way is merely one of billions of galaxies. <laughs> By measuring the motion of the most distant galaxies, Hubble made another startling discovery. All the galaxies are moving away from us and from each other. The universe is expanding. Modern astronomers have discovered a universe so vast that light from its most distant parts takes billions of years to reach us. We've learned that galaxies are not scattered randomly, but congregate in clusters surrounding bubbles of emptiness. And radio telescopes reveal the entire universe glows with energy. What is this mysterious cosmic light that shines from every direction? Why does the universe have such a strange architecture? And why is it expanding? Like Ptolemy, nearly 2,000 years ago, modern scientists used the language of mathematics to tell stories about the universe. 
We test theories by constructing virtual universes, using computers that can do trillions of calculations every second. The story that scientists tell today is as strange as any ancient myth. Astronomers think that around 14 billion years ago, everything, all matter and energy, time and space, was compressed into a point smaller than an atomic nucleus. existed before it, but something triggered the biggest explosion of all time. Not an explosion into space, but an explosion of space itself. As the cosmic fireball expanded, it cooled energy transformed into matter. In time, the relentless force of gravity herded clouds of matter into stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Today, the universe is still expanding from that ancient Big Bang that we think started it all. And the light shining from all directions is the fading afterglow of the primordial explosion a snapshot of the universe just after it was created. Computer simulations of the early universe show how clusters of galaxies might have condensed from gas clouds. These simulations show the same cobweb-like structure as we now observe. That makes us think that our theories about the Big Bang and cosmic evolution provide a good explanation. But, like many astronomers before us, we're struggling to explain new observations that don't seem to fit our theories. For instance, the universe seems to be filled with invisible material called dark matter. Without it, the universe would have expanded too quickly and galaxies would not have formed. We know dark matter exists because its gravity distorts the light from distant galaxies. We observe its effects, but we don't know what it is. Dark matter should be slowing the expansion of the universe, but we discovered that several billion years ago, a mysterious, repulsive force began to accelerate the expansion. We call this strange force dark energy. Such new plot development suggests that our story of the Big Bang is incomplete. There's plenty of work for future Ptolemies, Galileos, and Hubbles.
it's a bitterly cold desert. How does an entire planet change so drastically? The catastrophe of one world may become a lesson for another. What we learn from Mars could guide us in protecting our own environment. Just as we learn about ourselves by studying other creatures, we can learn about our planet by understanding distant worlds. Five million years ago, an asteroid slammed into Earth and radically altered the climate. 80% of all living things, including dinosaurs, became extinct. It's 200 years ago, we didn't even know asteroids exist. Today, we're exploring ways to deflect one, should it be headed our way. And how to save ourselves from extinction. Understanding asteroids and climate change is certainly critical. But what about dark matter and the expansion of the universe? Right now, we can't say. But our cities blaze with light because Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla were curious about something that once seemed just as strange. Electricity. We human beings have survived. Not because we're particularly strong or fast or fierce, but because we are curious and inventive. Earth may not be the center of the universe, but it is our center. It's the only place, as far as we know, where conscious beings ponder the universe and strive Aww. to give it meaning, to find <laughs> answers to those age-old fundamental yeah. questions. How are we? Yeah. How did we get here? depth of our knowledge, our perception of the universe, and our place in it. Like Earth and everything on it, we are made of stardust. No wonder we're fascinated by the night sky. When we go to the stars with our spacecraft, our telescopes, and in our minds, Use the two exits there on either side of the 